Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to my session, Designing Content Authoring Experiences. Um, my name is, sorry, it's a little awkward because of my cables down here and my presenter notes and whatnot, so I'll do my best. Um, my name is Greg Dunlap. I'm the director of strategy at Lullabot. We are a digital agency um, specializing in large-scale publishing for Drupal, and in recent years, we've been uh, heavily focused in the higher ed and gov spaces. Uh, I was most recently, well, no, I was, I began my sort of uh, government experience with a large-scale replatforming for the state of Georgia that happened five or six years ago, and since then have done um, a similar project for another state government that's currently in process and a lot of work with the state of Massachusetts. And I've had a lot of real interest in the state of, in the government space and the, the, the public business sector space recently. And this is a problem that is a big one in that space. Um, if you're not familiar with Lullabot, we've been in business for almost 20 years now. Um, our clients have typically covered a broad spectrum of verticals, including media and publishing, financial services, and more recently, a big focus again on higher ed and state government. Um, we are also, as of two years ago, 100% employee owned, um, which is a great change. That was a um, when our founders, Matt Westgate and Jeff Robbins, um, decided to exit the company. They wanted to show their appreciation to many of the people who had been there since the beginning, and that was their gift back to us, and so it's really great for us to have that. Um, so, um, content authoring. Um, some time ago, I was at a content strategy conference called Confab, and a woman um, named Laura Robertson stood on the main stage, and she walked up to the mic, and she said, everybody who loves their CMS in this room raised their hand, and the result was predictable. Um, I think that was emblematic of how a lot of people who live in the editorial space view their CMS. Um, there's a great quote by a guy named Dean Barker in his book, Real World Content Modeling, that says, in my experience, the main reason that people look to replace their CMS is because their editors hate it. And I think that it's really interesting because I think a lot of editors don't hate their CMS. They hate the people who built their CMS. <laughs> and the, the reason for that is that because they were not a part of the process, right? The CMS was not built for them and their needs. This was in my very first ever Drupal project. I was working at the Seattle Times doing uh, replatforming from a lot of homegrown hodgepodge CMSs into a Drupal site, and we launched. And the editorial team kept coming to me and asking me, where is this, where is this, where is this? And it was functionalities that had been in the old system that we never created in the new one because we had never asked them. We had never talked to them about what their problems and what their needs were. And that really highlighted to me and began a focus for me on making sure, for instance, when we work with clients that, and we're doing initial workshops and research, that editorial people and content authors are in the room and at the table and part of the process. Um, and so um, I think that you know it's 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 a really important thing because people can't be expected. You know, companies spend millions of dollars on these replatforming process that make people's lives hell and that make them not want to use their CMS. Like, why would you spend all of this money to make a tool that people don't want to use? When people don't want to use their CMS, they don't go in there and create content. They don't maintain content. They don't spend the time to craft content that's good for your organization. And that's the main reason why this is so important, aside from the fact that you know we shouldn't be making people's lives miserable. Also, the fact that it's just good business to pay attention to content authoring experience and editorial needs. Um, before we get into how the process and how, I think there's one important thing that we need to talk about, and that's the fact that the context in which you're working in really matters. Um, approaching the authoring experience for Drupal as a monolithic thing which has a single answer is a mistake, just like approaching a CMS as a monolithic thing that has a single answer is a mistake. Use, there's no right or wrong or best content authoring. All there is is the authoring experience that's being built for the users that you have and the needs of your organization. Um, an example of that is that, for instance, if you are building a system for a tech startup, you're talking about a commercial enterprise 
that is probably running one single site, um, probably has professional, well-trained marketing people with CMS experience who are knowledgeable about the web and how it's built and are writing SEO-focused product marketing content intended to convert. Take that and compare it to a state government where you're often building a platform of sites being entered by subject matter experts with little CMX experience who don't have any specialized knowledge about the web and are putting broad service-based information for constituents, the needs of those two audiences are vastly different. And so thinking that there's any way that I, I spent some time talking to some people who are working, for instance, on the Drupal admin UI initiative, and they're doing a lot of really good work. But the work that they're doing is more broadly to think about Drupal's admin as a concept. But when we're talking about authoring experience, we should really be focusing on use cases. And that's one of the things that kind of drives me crazy about Drupal is that by trying to be for everyone, Drupal is for no one. And that's something that we at Lullabot and other integrators really need to focus on more is finding their use cases to bring that together for the people that we're working with. So, um, how? How do we make this happen? So, um, I would say that the process that we go through to make this happen is very similar to the process by, that you go through to make a website for end users. And that's because your authors are a user of your CMS, just like the people who visit your site are. So, it begins with research. We do prototyping, where especially if we're coming up with new concepts, we run them by content authors to make sure that they are getting their needs met. Um, we implement, we test, and then we leave our clients in a place where they can continue to support their authors on an ongoing basis after the CMS is built and we've left. Um, that's a lot of stuff to go over, and so I'm going to kind of focus mostly on the research and implementation phases here um, for, the, for the necessity of time. Um, and this, this talk is already very packed, so, um, so let's talk about those things here. So research. I think that the benefit of doing research is pretty well known in, web, in the web field these days, but um, I think that there's one thing that's really um, kind of a side goal when you start doing research with content authors, and that's that it gets them invested in the process. In a lot of organizations, there's a lot of antagonism between editorial teams and technical teams for a lot of the reasons that I've already described, and there's usually a level of distrust there as well. And when you're doing research, what you're doing is you're working to bridge that gap. You're making people say, hey, your needs are important, and you're bringing them to the table with other stakeholders so that they can make their needs known to, you know, sort of compete in the battleground of prioritization that is the beginning of any web project. Um, and, you know, again, that's why when we start with new clients and they start telling us the stakeholders they want, we always make sure that we bring editorial people as a part of that process in our initial research and workshops. And a big um, set of that is that we do interviews with all of the, with a lot of, uh, a broad range of content authors when we start our process. Um, it's the most direct feedback that you can get, and it allows you to pe hear people's day-to-day -day from frustrations. And it allows you to identify themes. For instance, one of the things that we hear commonly with a lot of government um, agencies is document management is a big problem. Mm -hmm. You know. PDFs, versioning of PDFs, how we know that we have the right things linked in the right places, et cetera. That's not something that necessarily we are going to hear from the business stakeholders because they don't have to experience the frustration of dealing with it every day. Um, and actually, this is really part of my favorite part of the project because not only are we really hearing from real users and figuring out how to benefit them, but we're getting them excited about the project too, which is one of the things that we really want. Um, we usually develop a protocol when we do our interviews, and it's really just a template that outlines um, anything that you would want to do to conduct the interview. It's mostly just questions you ask every person when you're interviewing an introduction material and um, a place for notes. We'll usually make one of these for 
We'll, we'll make a template, and then we'll make one copy for every person we're interviewing. We'll set them all up with their name and their role and everything, and then we can use it to take notes while we're doing the interviews. We'll usually have one person doing the interview and one person taking notes because it's very hard to multitask in that way. Um, and this is a really good way for us to um, start working with people and get, and get that information together in a standardized format. Um, a link to a copy of this template plus a bunch of other resources are at the end of these slides, which I'll make available after the conference is over. Um, but also important is identifying who you want to interview. And in a small organization, it's fairly easy, but in a larger organization, it's um, more important. I think that the most important thing when you're choosing who to interview is to get a really broad range of viewpoints. So for instance, you want like the biggest, most enterprise um, state agency, for instance, when we're doing a state government, and the smallest one where they only have one person who does their, who updates their website for five hours a, a month, you know? We wanna get the people who are real advocates for web future and the people who are completely grumpy about, about the project and don't wanna hear about it, you know? Um, you, we we wanna hear all of these use cases because especially when we're doing large-scale replatformings that need to fit a lot of that, that need to fit a lot of different needs um, we we need to hear all of those needs we need to know what they want as far as conducting to the interview um, you know I think that we it's important to have a protocol with a standard set of questions but it's also important to be free enough to veer off into side topics as they come up if you think they're important or think they can bring you um, they think they can bring you value. It's not. It's not a set of rules. It's a guide and a starting point, point and a place to go from. Um, I think that the kind of thing we and and we usually use it to dig really deep into a lot of topics, especially when they come very broadly. So, for instance, a lot of the times we hear from content authors, we need more design freedom, and that can mean a lot of things. And Every person who tells us that needs something different. They really have a different need that's not being met. And so we help to broadly dig into those needs when somebody tells us something broad. Or when they tell us, oh, I need the ability to change text color in the editor. Well, why do you need that ability? What are you trying to accomplish? Because a lot of times authors will come up with solutions to a problem that doesn't actually solve the problem that they're having. Because for instance, the um, the the one that like like we heard from a higher ed, I need the ability to change my tech I need I need a color picker in the C in the CK editor because our school colors are gold and green and I need to be able to choose colors, right? And it's like that use case is very different from somebody who wants the ability to highlight things to make them more appropriate. And so getting to those needs beyond the, the solutions that they're looking for is really important. Um, there's a, um, there's a, there's a um, popular guide that says you should always ask why five times um, and to get to the answer to a problem and we take that to heart a lot and um, another thing that we really like to do is to conduct interviews in the places where people work and the reason for it, it's been hard when you're remote and stuff but when we go on site we like to do it and the reason is if somebody says something like oh it takes me 10 clicks to create a new piece of content we can actually sit down and have them show us what they're doing because they're at their desk, they're logged into the CMS, we don't have to mess around with anything. And that way I can say, I know it doesn't take 10 clicks to create a piece of content. So I want to know what's going wrong. Do they misunderstand how to get to the place of, to create a piece of content? Has their CMS been designed in a way that obscures the pathway to get to it? I don't know unless I can see. Um, and it also kind of puts them at ease. You're in their space in where they're used to, and you can go on from there. As we conduct interviews, we summarize them in a matrix which outlines our key findings and interviewee engagement. Um, and getting all this high-level information is really useful, especially when we want to share it with the stakeholders for decision-making and to, again, identify common threads. Um, there's a link to this as well in the, um, in the notes. So that's about interviewing. We also do a lot of other kinds of research. For instance, we do we often do prototyping. Um, one of the things that we do, especially in modern, more sort of com 
component or block-based systems is we come in with a set of authors and we have a template for their page, which is basically a uh, printed out uh, sheet of poster board with a, with a kind of frame around it. And then we give them components that represent the components in their system and say, can you build the pages that you need using these? And they kind of move them around and say, oh, we often need to do this. And we look around and say, hmm, this one's close, but not quite. What do you think of that? And then we have a pile of cards that we can draw out and do stuff. It's, it's actually really fun. So, but um, again, um, there's a lot more here than I can actually get into today. Um, but I've been doing a lot of writing and speaking on this topic at lolabot.com if you want to find out more about that. So implementation. What can we do in Drupal itself to support content elements? I kind of look at this from two angles. There's the actual entering of content into forms and the support of content that is already created or in the process of being created. So content entry and content administration. Um, so content entry, it's interesting that um, you know HTML forms are are one of the oldest technologies on the web, and a lot of content entry is filling out forms. And if you're doing this for a while, you know a lot of rules around what makes good and bad forms. Um, and a lot of that's true, but forms in a CMS are a little different. For instance, when you fill out a form online to submit your interest for product and want a salesperson to call you, you're only filling that form out once. And then you walk away and you're done. Whereas in a CMS, people are filling out these forms hundreds, if not thousands of times a year. And so their use cases are slightly different. Um, CMS content also have, um, interrelates in a way that standalone web forms often don't. And understanding those interrelations is really important. Um, and but on the other side, general web forms are meant to be used by people who haven't been trained at all, the general public. And content management system web forms, ideally, are for people who have access to real training and documentation. And that's actually good in some ways. Um, so while these forms may seem like a simple implementation of common technology that we're all used to, there's also elements that make that unique. And so a lot of these implications can change in this new context. One of the biggest things I think that we need to do when we're designing CMS forms is to reduce cognitive load. Uh, cognitive load theory was developed by John Sweller in the late 1980s to describe the mental effort needed to learn new things. And the theory goes that individuals can only hold so much in information in their working memory at once. And if you present more than they can hold, then their working memory becomes overloaded and learning becomes more difficult. And the same experience can and has often been used in user experience design to describe the mental effort needed to learn and use a product. And of course, now it can be used in this, um, in this area as well, um, especially in a place where you know, modern web content is very complex. It requires a lot of fields, taxonomy, metadata, etc. And so reducing the cognitive load as much as possible is crucial to a well-designed offering experience. And it's important to know that like, this is not a flat scale. Like, The less familiar someone is with a concept, the more cognitive load it will add to their work. So if your site authors are generally unfamiliar with web concepts, the usage of metadata, how taxonomy applies in a broad way in your site, they are already starting off at a disadvantage. Um, and if they have minimal training, that makes it even worse. Um, they're going to have a high cognitive load before they even get going, and you're going to have to work even harder to make things easier for them. At the same time, it's hard because reducing cognitive load doesn't mean that you make your authoring experience so simple that it undercuts your organizational goals in the first place. Like a, you know, a lot of content authors love WordPress because it's very simple, but the um, process of dumping a bunch of stuff into a body field with no greater organizational or conceptual system causes a lot of problems. And so the key is to build something that meets everyone in the middle. And there's an important aspect of that in terms of the people that you hire and work with that I'll get to at the end. Um, one of the biggest ways to reduce cognitive load in with your content authors is to embrace consistency in the author. And I think that one of the problems with how a lot of Drupal developers approach the authoring experience is they don't. They create a bunch of fields and shove them in and walk away, 
right? And there's a lot of things that we can do, very simple things to improve that, that, um, that will help out a lot in very basic ways. Um, for instance, when you make information about, about where things are placed in forms, make them as consistent as possible. Taxonomy choices should generally be together and in one place on all of your editorial forms, whether it's at the bottom, on the side, consistency. Um, display settings and metadata should not be in the sidebar for one content type and at the bottom for another, you know. Um, consistency is one of the biggest factors to reducing cognitive load for authors. Um, you should also be consistent in your field widgets. For instance, we recently encountered a system that had three different technologies for building flexible landing pages. And that lack of consistency was very confusing for content authors who never really understood when to use each one or what the differences or benefits were in them and how they could successfully leverage each one. And we see this a lot, especially in systems that have grown organically over time. Like, you know, if you've got a system that's been around for 10 years in the Drupal world, you've crossed like four paradigms for flexible landing page building in your site. And we're going to see them all. And that's a problem, and it's one of the things that we see all the time with sites that aren't maintained, they're just added on to. And, um, and that maintenance is something we'll talk about later, too. Be, also, be consistent in the terminology that you're using. Refer to items on a form using the same words across the system. And words is actually another really important part of form design that we should talk about. The words and text that we write in the authoring system are vital in providing context to authors, and it's often given no thought at all. Like, even if they exist, often we see they're written by developers, and they describe the what of something as opposed to the why, and, you know, everyone knows that a title field is, enter the title here is not helpful, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think I, I saw a really interesting quote recently in a book called Designing UX, Create Forms That Don't Drive Your Users Crazy. This book is 15 years old. Um, the core of the interaction is the questions in a form, is the questions asked and the answers given. That's why the words we use in the form and not how it looks are the most important part of the design. And I think that's absolutely true, especially in authoring experiences. And in Drupal, there's a lot of places where those words appear. Um, we've got form labels, we've got help text, we've got validation text, we've got field value descriptions. And those can really help your navigate, help your users navigate your interface as long as they're thoughtfully crafted. And again, there's no one size fits all answer to this. Um, if your users are very technical and very experienced, you may use different wording than in other places. I actually think there's a lot of cases where using internal jargon is useful in these things. For instance, you know. There's a lot of jokes about TLAs in government, but a lot of times using the acronyms that people are used to in these systems is better because that's the way their brains work. You know, when you when you've been working in government for a long time, that you you internalize a lot of that stuff. And so, in a lot of ways, writing to that audience can be really important to help them out along the way. Um, Again, some general principles about words on note forms. You want to keep it simple, follow guidelines for plain language. Um, the more authors you have and the more diverse their jobs and experiences, the more that the words you choose matter. And writing for a diverse group means maintaining a laser focus on simplicity and clarity. Um, again, as I said, use the, use, use the, technolo the terminology of the user. Um, if they're, if they're, people are well-versed in the jargon of your organization, then feel free to use it if it's going to help to communicate with them. But then the flip side of that is you should avoid the terminology of the CMS. Like we say, we in the Drupal word, world throw around the word node like it's a <laughs> as if everybody in the world should understand what that means. And we find a lot of times that people will, will, that will drift into the help text that we used, and it's not helpful at all. Um, directional language like things see the field above or see the sidebar to the right can be really um, damaging actually. Um, it can change over time and so if something moves and this still says to the right over here because you forgot to update the help text, it breaks, it breaks your documentation. Um, also things can move on the screen if you're on a mobile device. Sidebars often drop to the bottom in when you're in mobile and things like that. 
and it can confuse people who are using things like screen readers and assistive technologies. Um, all of these suggestions are actually really, really helpful for accessibility. Um, and then the last thing is that's really important is saying what isn't as important as saying why or how it impacts the content that's created. Um, one of the most common things that we often do, for instance, in modern systems is we provide a field that um, that is a short summary that's used for the site for a page's meta description and in listings. And to say to an average content author, this is used in meta descriptions and listings is not helpful. To say things like, for instance, when Google, dis so we try to say things like, when this is when this is displayed in Google, the text here will be um, the description that's displayed with the link and things like that. You know, again, terminology that explains what the impact of this is and why it's important is really um, is really important to me. Ordering. So you know, when we design sites, um, you design these pages with a hierarchy of content that you put the most important information at the top of the page and you work your way down um, in importance in the page. A lot of thought goes into this hierarchy and a lot of work in the design process. So why, when we're making editorial forms, doesn't the content that we enter match this hierarchy? Um, it's, really, it's really important, I believe, to make that match this hierarchy. It provides a better mental model for content authors to understand where things go on a page if it matches this. And so many times, these fields are just in completely random order that make no sense at all. Um, and, and content authors are often visualizing pages in their head when they're entering things. They, they don't think about the words, they think about how it's going to look. And that's especially true with the kind of content authors we see in government who tend to not be web people but instead be subject matter experts. And so, Content entry screens laid out in the order that they expect is really helpful and intuitive. Um, I will say that there's a kind of side to this that's also, the more a field is used, the lower it should be on a page. And sometimes these two things come into conflict. For instance, we recently were working on a site where there was a featured image up here that you could put into the text next to the title but it was very rarely used because a lot of the agencies didn't have the quality imagery to support their content. And so even though it's high up on the page, we ended up pushing it lower in the editing screen because we found that most of the users were just skipping it constantly and it was getting in their way. So while the general principle of put things in order that they appear on the screen is good, also, we also take into consideration how often they're being used. Because again, something that somebody's constantly skipping to get to the next thing is cognitive load and thought that they don't have to be spending all the time. Um, and these are just three examples of considerations for content entry forms. There's so much more we could get into. Um, there's error handling, field validation, related content, all sorts of other stuff. But this gives you an idea of some of the things you should be thinking about. Um, I actually proposed a talk to DrupalCon this year that was called 10 Practical Things That You Can Do in Drupal to Improve Your Content Authoring, and it gets it allows me to dive more into detail on a lot of these topics, error handling in particular, um, which is a big one that Drupal drives me crazy about. But so hopefully, if you're going to DrupalCon, you can look forward to that. Um, content administration. We talk about the actual entering of content. Content administration is how we deal with it once it's been entered. What content type should we choose? What is the workflow? How do people find it and manage it? Um, you know, the authoring experience starts immediately right after someone logs into the CMS. And a common feature is to put a list of recent content on the page um, with some search options, and that's what Drupal does by default. And I think that's fine, but something more customized can really give authors a much more personalized experience that sets the tone for their work. Um, this is a dashboard that we did for the American Booksellers Association. Um, and when people log in, they get that list of content, but they also get a lot of links to things that they want to do commonly. Um, orders that are pending payment, orders that are in processing, new orders that have come in since the last time they visited very specific tasks for the use cases that the booksellers who use this system have to do on a common um, on a common basis. Another thing that we've seen done for state government clients is things like, you know, 
putting together a scoring system for page quality and listing the ones that need the most help on the login page so that they're right in front of people when they get to them um, all the time. Um, we've seen you know, a lot of things about like easy access to documentation and reference material on the landing page, et cetera. Um, these may be different and what's appropriate from one organization to another or even roles within a specific organization is different. The person who's responsible for reviewing and publishing content may want a different list than the person who's responsible for writing and submitting it. But these are the kinds of things that we figure out in research when we're talking to people and what they do in the systems. Um, some, again, some things that we commonly see is um, the work that you are currently working on or have worked on, the work that other people have worked on but which you need to review, um, alerts from external systems like Sign Improve, Google Search Console, et cetera, which can highlight accessibility or other problems, and easy links to documentation and support. Um, creating a new piece of content is often the first order of business for an author, and it's one of the most important choices that they make, because at least at Wall when we design content types, they're designed to serve specific business purposes, but content authors often choose them for the display functionalities or the level of flexibility that they offer. And that's one of the reasons why we design them very strategically and with guardrails to avoid that. But, you know, a lot of times the content authors, again, in government, when we're really working with subject matter experts who aren't familiar with the web, um, they don't understand how content types differ or why they're more flexible or one is more restrictive for the other. And so guiding users to choose um, the proper content types is a really crucial. And you know, some of these choices are pretty straightforward. Nobody's going to create an event when they need to create a blog post, although I've many times seen people do the opposite. Um, and um, But some examples are more subtle. So for instance, if you look here, the difference between news and press release is really unclear. And one of the reasons why is the words that they're used. Again, the descriptions don't really significantly explain the difference between these things. They talk about the what, but not the why. Um, and clarification for the why is one of the things, again, in the words that we choose that can guide authors towards making better decisions. But another problem is that one short description just doesn't give you a lot of room to talk about the use cases that you need. And so when we did our project with the state of Georgia, we created a new um, content type uh, selection screen that offered a lot more. And so there's a lot more here, and it serves to provide better context to content authors. In addition to the short description, there's opportunity for extended information, which can provide more context. Um, you know, in the case of news here, it clarifies where the postings will be located on the site, as well as that they're not appropriate for official updates. In the case of press release, it clarifies where to go to check if the use case is appropriate, as well as the additional information that images can't be used in press releases. And that's a good cue because if you have images or you might want to use or need one, then this is telling you this is probably not the right place to go. The page thumbnails and icons also serve to provide more context to users because again, authors often think of how their page is going to be displayed and look at the end rather than the content in it. So if you can give them some cues as to how a page might look through these thumbnails, then that gives them additional context in which they might be guided to make better decisions. Because um, as we can, again, a news release has photos in it, but a press release does not. Um, and finally, there's a link to see other content of this type that allows authors to check and see examples of how this content type's been used so that they can see I wonder what other things have been done here that I can get learned from. And that's another point, which is that the needs of new users are often different than the needs of seasoned users who have been around for a while. And when we tested this with the authors at Georgia, a common complaint was that it took up too much real estate and they had to scroll constantly to get to the bottom. And so what we did was we added a toggle that, was, that could be remembered from session to session that allowed more advanced users who didn't need the descriptions anymore to change this to grid mode. It removed the extended description and the thumbnails, replaced them with icons, and gave them a much more concise view of the data. 
Um, we also wanted to, but didn't get around to adding a favorites option. So for instance, if you do a lot of event management on your site, you could mark a, the event content type as a favorite and it would bubble up to the top. Um, that's something that we hope to do in a future iteration of this module. Um, this module is called Type Tray. It's been released on Drupal.org, and you can use it on your projects if you want to. Type what? Type Tray. Can I ask a question about yeah. the thumbnail? Yeah. Um, was that just, is that just a JPEG, or is it actually? Or a PNG or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, but whatever, you might change the look of that content type in Drupal. Does that automatically change? No, no. Yeah. Those yeah. were custom crafted by our designers for the client gotcha. in general. Yeah. Would have been too slow. Yeah, okay. yeah the, the module adds some additional metadata to the content type editing screen to do things like add the extra descriptions and the thumbnails and the icons and things like that. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, I also want to address the topic of designing for accessibility because just as accessibility is important for the end users of your website, it's also important for your content authors because people with different cognitive and physical dis disabilities need to use your tools as well. Um, I think a lot of us are familiar with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG, but there's a whole set of different standards for authoring tools called the Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines, and it's a very deep topic and anybody who has read the web accessibility guidelines understands they're very thick um, and so I don't want to get into too much detail it's not an area of expertise of mine but very broadly I would say that there are two main aspects of, of ATAG the authoring experience guidelines the first is that the authoring interface itself must be accessible so things like making sure that status indicators are accessible to those using accessible technologies, like the markings, for instance, from misspelled fonts. Um, the interface should respect OS level settings that the user has set, dark mode, zoom, et cetera. Um, and any preview shown in the tool should be as accessible as the content when the page is shown for real on the front end. Because we find that a lot of previewing tools will provide actually much more limited functionality than the end result will be, even if they look the same. And so, um, and I've seen a lot of examples of live preview for Drupal while we're editing in the last couple of years, and that's something really important to keep in mind when you're investigating those tools. Additionally, it must provide everything the author needs to create accessible content. So, does the tool create accessible markup in its templates? Our editor is giving guidance for how to create accessible content, for instance, the ability to add alt text to images. Is there a way for authors to perform accessibility text and are authors given the tools to fix them when they are found? And does the documentation promote accessibility? Drupal's default backend is pretty good when it comes to ATAG compatibility, but there's a lot of work to do as well as in the tools like CK Editor, which we integrate, and there's also a lot of work in CK Editor side going to be ATAG compliant. Um, if you were interested in that, um, the, the, at the end of the um, slides, I've got a link to the Drupal.org tracking issue for ATAG compliance, and, or you may want to talk, there's a guy named Mike Gifford, who I think might be here, I'm not positive. He's not, okay, but he's, he, huh? In France. Oh, he hasn't come back from DrupalCon yet. Okay, I thought he might be here. Um, then I won't direct you to talk to him at this conference. <laughs> so that's a lot of information from the technical standpoint and from the research standpoint, but I think there's one more other really important thing that we should talk about. You know, people use your systems, like actual real human beings. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, these people have kind of feelings and thoughts and dreams, and they'll use your system day out, day in and day out for years on end. Um, there's a guy, um, Dean Barker, who I quoted at the beginning of this presentation. He has an excellent article titled, Software Isn't the Problem. And in it, he points out that the biggest failures he sees in CMS projects have nothing to do with the software or the technology. They have to do with teams that are inadequately staffed, improperly trained, given unrealistic time constraints for the work that they have to do. And I would add one more thing to this, and that's that they don't understand the web. One of the things about the modern web is that content is extremely complicated. It has to fit a lot of needs. It has to be mobile friendly. It has to be accessible. It has to be searchable. 
and to be found by search engines. It has to be written in a way that communicates with people, that uses plain language, that uses the words the end users use as opposed to the words that we use. And it has to be organized in a way that they think rather than the way our organizations think, which is all too common. And that's a lot of nuance and a lot of expertise to understand. And it requires a really big picture of your view of, of your site and how it's organized. And you know who's entering content into government sites? It's subject matter experts. It's people who don't understand the web. And they shouldn't. It's not their jobs. You know? It's really not what they were hired to do. And I think, you know, a lot of organizations expect that anyone can do content, anyone can write things, and it does a real disservice, not just to the content that we are writing, but to the people who are being told to write it and create it. Because the expectations being put on them cannot be met properly. Especially when we consider the fact that a lot of those people, again, especially in government organizations, are not doing the web full time. They're shoving it in as a part of their work. They're handed a pile of CES, PDFs, and told to copy and paste them and upload them and shove them out onto the site. And that results in an awkward, awful experience for both sides of the um, process. And so I would love for all of us at our organizations to switch that around. And Talk about how we can properly staff our teams with content professionals who understand the web, who are properly trained, and are given the realistic time to do their work. Because if we really want to be truly user-centric in the work that we do in government and really serve our constituents, this is what needs to happen. A lot of people ask me, clients in the sales process, ask me what the most common problems we see or why the projects that we do fail most often. And the answer I always tell them is you can't solve people problems with technology. You can re-platform your CMS every five years, and a lot of organizations do, and this is the reason why. Because they are trying to solve organizational problems with technology, and you can't. It never works. At the end of the day, but it's hard because at the end of the day, doing that work is the only way to truly transform your site. And you know what? Prioritizing editorial experience means prioritizing content, which means developing a content strategy, which means taking content and how you present it to your constituents as the first order of business as your site. Because that leads me to the second truth of all of the projects I've ever worked on, and I've been doing this work for 30 years, and that is that content strategy is organizational change. You cannot do web content properly without rethinking the way that your organization works and is prioritized. It's truly understanding who your users are and developing content for their needs, because otherwise any technological solution you do is abandoned. And that's why this is all so hard. And that's why trying to do this without organizational change, which many of us try to do day in and day out, is so difficult. I can come in and re-platform you to a new CMS, and I do it all the time, and I walk out of those projects knowing that in five years they're going to be stuck in the exact same place that they were when we started because of this. And so the thing that I would say for those of us who are in place and who care about content and want to prioritize it for both our end users and our authors is to break the cycle and be advocates for true content-centric change in our organizations. And that is not easy work, and it doesn't happen overnight, but the more that we can move that needle forward, the better our organizations will be over time. Um, this is only the part of a much larger process of supporting your content authors, as I've mentioned. Um, I am in the process of writing a book on this topic. I started this book about a year and a half ago. I had a publisher. I went through a first draft and was in the editorial process when my publisher began to fail financially and stopped process on all of their works in progress. Um, so I have a book, sort of, and I had a publisher, but I don't right now. Um, and so I'm looking for a new publisher to carry that work to completion right now. If anybody knows any book publishers who might be interested in a book on content authoring experience, I would encourage them to let me know, although I have gotten in touch with all of these usual suspects, um, as long as it's not packed. 
Um, so, um, but on the other hand, uh, you can find me on Blue Sky and LinkedIn. And if you want to follow me, I'll be using those places for updates. I also write a lot for the Lullabot.com blog. And um, that's it. Um, I know we're right at the end of time, but I would love to take any questions or if you want to talk to me afterwards, I'm more than happy to do that. I have two quick recommendations yeah. and then a question. So, one is um, design system. I yeah. didn't say much about that, but I think no. that's a really important part of mm -hmm. making your blueprint better. And within your CMS, putting links to the part of the design system yep. that applies to that particular paragraph, whatever you're sure. writing, so you can easily access that. Um, second, um, making it so that when they choose certain things in the, the form, Things either oh, right. appear or disappear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, make a big, big difference in terms of like the cognitive load of all these things that I can think about based on their choices. It can, although I'll say that when I see forms that do that, it makes me wonder if they've misdesigned their content types. Mm -hmm. Because to me, if you've got a content type that serves three use cases that you have to hide in show fields on, right. I'm wondering if you're building too much complexity into one thing where, when it might make more sense to break it out. So I agree with you in some ways, but it's also kind of a red flag for me sometimes. Right, too. right. But yeah, it depends on what Yeah, exactly. Right. It depends on the situation. Yeah. yeah. And then my, my question is, is um, nested. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest problem I have with is is, is that it, it's so hard for people to manage content when it's in we, we, but, but you have to have sometimes these nested yeah. paragraphs. Do um, you have any suggestions on how to improve that? Experience? My general impression is that if you are going more than one level of nesting, then your design is broken. Right. Um, even even just one yeah. level. I mean, and when I say nesting, yeah. I don't even usually nest. What what we will do, for instance, is is like, um, what's an example I can come up with? We recently did a content type for Georgia and our other government project called How Do I? And basically what it is is a how-to with steps that you need to manage to, um, to do a task. For how do I get a driver's license, right? And then... You enter, then you enter the series of steps that someone has to go through to do that. And each of the steps is another content type in and of itself that you nest into that. And what I usually try to do when we have to do that is to just kind of mentally forget that that other content type is. So often we we'll use, we don't use paragraphs a lot at Drupal, we just use content types most of the time. But I'll use inline entity file, for instance. And that allows you to, within the content type that you started in, add a step add a step, and it's not nested, it's just kind of integrated into the form as a whole, it, as a natural part of the process. And you know, that whole process of how to do, I still encounter Drupal sites that for instance, if you have to add an author to a blog post, you have to go to someplace else and add the author and then come back, and that is to me is, a, is that like, if you have to do that, there are a lot of solutions. The inline entity form one is one that we use. There are a lot of other ways to approach that. But anything that can integrate it as a natural part of their flow and make it look and feel as if it's just a part of the content type that they started on to begin with is, is helpful and useful. Yeah.